So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Frank, and I'm, I'm giving you a talk on, on cloud computing security. Of course, I heard you're all interested in cloud computing and security, so we're talking about it. Um, what I've prepared for today is I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction about me and where I'm coming from. Um, of course, obviously, I'm not from Plymouth. Then we're going to talk a little bit about cloud computing, and I give you a, a rough idea what cloud computing is and what it isn't. And I'll show you some cloud characteristics and the corresponding problems of that. Then I'll, I'll we, we discuss some of these security problems, and then I'm going to present an, an architecture, an actual project we are working on over there, uh, where I'm from, to to mitigate these these problems. And I'm going to show you a little demo of the system. And it's a live system, so it worked yesterday. It doesn't work ex works ex uh, as expected today but it's still doing its job, so let's see. I'm working with the, I'm a PhD student uh, and I'm working at the Cloud Research Lab over there in Fort Wang. We founded this Cloud Research Lab in 2009. Uh, my director of studies is Professor Dr. Christoph Reich, uh, who is also the head of, of our lab. And currently we have four PhD students over there, we get roughly eight thesis students every semester writing theses with us. We get some student assistants as well. And we're mainly doing research in cloud computing, cloud security, quality of service, and e-learning. So what we've done during the past years is we established um, clouds, basically, at our university. And right now we're running three different cloud infrastructures over there. And the main one, which might be interesting, is a thing we call Studi Cloud. And it's basically a cloud infrastructure which enables every student who is with the university to fire up his own virtual machine, accesses, uh, do lab exercises on it. Um, some use it as game servers, some use it as just online storage. Um, so you can do whatever you want with it. Um, we made the software available on SourceForge as well. So you can go and check it out and try to install it. Although the version which is online is kind of outdated, so everything you're going to see today is not in there. A second thing which we are using our cloud for is high-performance high computing, since we had a, a formal relationship with the Technical University in Prague. And over there, they have a lot of mathematicians and physicists and biologists, and apparently they like to calculate, and they need clusters for that. They have huge clusters. Um, and so most of the students over there need a cluster of 20 machines for a certain period of time to run their experiments, and afterwards um, they get the results. So what we built was something we called Viteras, a virtual cluster as a service where you sign up, you create 20 virtual machines, you submit your calculation job, the job gets submitted, afterwards you get your results, and the virtual machine uh, machines get deleted again. So your, your physical infrastructure uh, is still available and the space is freed. Computing. Okay. So cloud computing uh, comes in, in different service models which you can use. And something like Dropbox is something we call storage as a service. So basically, when we're talking cloud computing, it's an old idea of utility computing that you get the computing power you need um, delivered. And there are mainly three different um, service models in cloud computing. One of them is software as a service. So basically, you get a software without installing it. Uh, you access it via your browser or through an uh, application on, or an app, which basically goes back to a browser. And typical usage are the, the Google online products you might know. So Google Mail, everybody who's Google, using Google Mail for his emails is actually using a kind of cloud computing. Um, word processing, Office Online, Microsoft is doing it, some calendar tools, presentation, to-do list. So everything which you, which you basically just use as a software in your browser um, can be described as software as a service. Second form um, is platform as a service. And platform as a service basically gives you the opportunity to develop programs, code programs, and run them online in the cloud. So the cloud gives you resources, gives you a development environment, uh, which is standardized, gives you a huge amount of computing power. If you, you want to build big programs or big infrastructures over there, then you can get this. Um, you pay per usage. That's basically 
uh, on all different service delivery models in cloud computing, you pay per usage. So if you use it, you pay. If you don't use it, you don't pay. Third form and last form is infrastructure as a service. And infrastructure as a service is basically you get your own PC in the cloud. Before I make more theory, I show you an example here. Oops. So what I got here is basically a web interface for our cloud management system of our cloud in Furtwangen, the Studi Cloud. And unfortunately, it's in German, but I'm going to just uh, talk you through. So what I can do here is I, I can start a wizard saying I want to have a new virtual machine, a new PC. So I'm going to choose between some available images. I'm going to choose a Ubuntu desktop here, give it the host name. It's available. The green stuff says it's available. Um, we're providing either Linux machines or, or Windows machines. If we're using Windows machines, then we provide the user with a default password, and he has to he has to change that at his first logon. If we're providing um, Linux machines, then we're we're providing the user with a with a um, key combination, a public and a private key. Who's aware of public and private keys? Everybody probably. So and what's going to happen now is that the system will create a virtual machine for you and it's going to be available in a couple of seconds. So long I'm going to talk you through this. So basically what you get is a virtual machine. Um, it's like a full computer. You access it through um, your browser or through uh, an SSH client, a terminal, which is pretty geeky. Uh, and people like I like to do that, or you, you access this through remote desktop, so you get a nice colorful desktop environment, um, or by an API, uh, a programming interface. And basically with this virtual machine you can do what you want. You can install software it, uh, on it, you can use it as a proxy to run movies, whatever. So let's see if it's available. Yes, it says active. So uh, instead of using the SSH, I'm, I'm going to use a, a remote desktop client here. And it's, who, who knows X2Go? Is anybody aware of X2Go? The program, who, you, uh, who knows remote desktop client for Windows? Yeah, it's basically the same just for Linux. So what I need to do is to add the key, which I just got from my interface, to use it. Okay. And we're connecting to it, and yes, it's a new key. I'll do this over wireless here, so it takes a little bit. But what we basically get is access a remote desktop to your VM I just created. So within a couple of seconds, so let's say 30 seconds or, or one minute, you get a new PC, you can do whatever you want with it, can, can do your calculations and stuff like that. Uh, if you don't use it anymore, you just delete it and that's it. So, now everybody should at least be aware what, what kind clou uh, what cloud computing is and what kind of cl cloud computings are out there. So, Coming to some cloud characteristics and to the security point of view of all this. With cloud computing, and especially with infrastructure as a service, we get some new characteristics of computing here, which we need to consider when we're talking about security. So first of all, <clears throat> we have shared resources in cloud. So although everybody likes to use this, this cloud figure to describe cloud compute. There is definitely some hardware in there somewhere. So some real servers, some real CPU, some real hard disks. And all these physical uh, resources are going to be shared by different customers. So we have a, a model we call multi-tenancy. We got access from everywhere. So normally you have your data center and the access to this data center is very limited. In cloud computing, this is almost open to, to everybody and to everywhere, because you want to access it from everywhere. 
In cloud computing, we have on-demand um, availability and a pay-on-demand model. So people sign up and immediately want to create virtual machines like I did uh, just a couple of minutes ago, and the system should cope with that. There's no long contract period. I don't have to contact my provider. I sign up. I put in some credentials. It's a public commercial thing. I put in some credit card information, and a couple of minutes later, I want to have my virtual machine. This basically comes to uh, third-party hosting. So all my processes I'm going to run, all my data I'm going to store in the cloud is basically hosted and saved at third parties of machines I'm not aware of. An important thing, which is the, the main enabler for cloud computing, is scalability. So in cloud computing, you create your virtual machine. And let's use this example here. It's an online shop example. So you run an online shop, a company runs an online shop. And if the demand of customers for this online shop is pretty low, then maybe one virtual machine is enough to satisfy this de demand. So now a new product launches, and the demand rises immediately. So, And we have many customers accessing this online shop right now. What's cool in cloud computing is you can define thresholds to scale up your infrastructure. So when the demand reaches a certain threshold, your infrastructure detects that, and new virtual machines get deployed. So your computing power increases, um, and you are able to satisfy this demand. If the demand drops, uh, you define, ha can have uh, thresholds defined as well, so your infrastructure decreases as well. And with this pay-on-demand uh, cost model in the background, you only pay for the resources you're actually using. So those are the main uh, advantages and cloud characteristics uh, we got. So basically, what we can say is that cloud computing, and especially infrastructure, as a service environments are very frequently changing, are a very dynamic infrastructure. From a cloud provider point of view, we have a certain amount of cloud hosts which are hosting virtual machines, and there are different customers um, playing with these virtual machines. Um, we see virtual machines get created, we see more virtual machines of the, sev uh, of, the, of the same time get created because there's a high demand, virtual machines get deleted, virtual machines get restarted on different hosts, virtual machine gets migrated. So um, it's completely different to a traditional data center where you have your certain service on certain uh, physical machines here. With these characteristics come some severe um, security challenges or security problems. And we're going to talk about some of them in more detail. Uh, I've listed them here. So one is, of them is unknown data location. And I'm going to elaborate this a little bit more. Second thing is abuse of cloud resources. Of course, you can use this, this scalability and this em in enormous amount of computing power to do fishy stuff as well. Um, we have some missing isolation in, in resources. We, we also will see that we have some missing security uh, monitoring here. We can use APIs to, to access cloud instances. So if we have vulnerabilities in one of these APIs, actually our cloud in infrastructure is vulnerable as well through these APIs. We have missing interoperability of, of several cloud providers. So if you start your, your business today and you sign up with Amazon uh, Cloud and you have all your machines there and then you think of something like business continuity, and you think, ah, if something happens at Amazon, I might want to have some virtual machine at, machines at Google Cloud as well. There's no uh, compatibility there yet. So you can't just move one VM from Amazon uh, into Google or, for example, to our cloud. The whole system or your whole IT infrastructure uh, gets more complex. So whereas it's completely sufficient to have a... Um, a backup image of a server in your data center. And whenever your server crashes, um, you just get this image deployed on a new host, um, and the server's back up and running again within minutes. This might uh, work in cloud computing, but um, experiences, especially with Amazon, has shown, has shown uh, that it's not that easy. And of course, we got new uh, possible attack ve vectors through this uh, scalability feature which I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in a second. So first important thing, unknown data location. 
So that's normally the image you get when cloud provider uh, advertise something like Dropbox or, or store your data in the cloud. And everybody is nice and, and we have fluffy white clouds here and everybody's fine, right? So let's put this picture in a slightly different environment here. And of course, I'm playing a bad guy here. But why aren't cloud provider not just advertising like this? So the problem is you don't know where your data is stored in cloud. So you don't actually know where the data centers are. And of course, you can ask your provider um, to give you this information. And he's gonna, probably going to give you something like uh, Amazon is doing. Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm going through a lot of Amazon bashing here. It's not particular Amazon. It's just that most of the news are on Amazon, but others aren't. Uh, better or worse. So um, they give you this information. Ah, yeah, our data center is in the US, or ah, our data center is in Northern Ireland. Um, but where and what does this mean? Is this, is this of any particular information for you? Um, I have a second thing. Who of you knows Configure? Anybody heard of Configure? Yes. What is it? It's a worm, exactly. It's quite a, quite a famous worm, and it, it's distribution worldwide, you can see here. So every red thing is, is a worm, or is, is infections of the configure worm. So um, you probably don't put your, your data into, into infected areas, right? So what I did, I just mapped the Google data centers of the Google Clouds on top of that. Apparently, of course, everywhere where the worm is, or everywhere where it's red, are the data centers as well. Because it's not just that they follow the worm, it's the other way around, right? But nobody's thinking about that when we're talking about uh, data as a storage. Everybody's just thinking about nice, fluffy clouds here. But you actually are not aware where your data is actually stored. And I don't know about the UK, but especially in Germany, this is a very severe problem because our data protection laws say that every customer has to make sure um, that he knows where his data are stored, where his data are processed, and he has actually to, to reassure that security measures are taken to secure this data. Okay, second thing, abuse of cloud resources. So of course you can do a lot of good things with cloud computing and with this infrastructure as a service thing, but apparently the, the uh, bad guys uh, get this information as well, and, and see all the possibilities. So we've seen uh, that so the source botnets or other botnets are hosted on Amazon EC2, which is the Amazon Cloud. Um, hackers used earlier this year the Amazon Cloud to just crack um, Apple IDs. And there's actually a business out there that you can uh, pay 200 euros to get a WPA key cracked. What's a WPA key? Paul? Yeah, that's the encryption thing of? For yeah, exactly, for wireless networks. And so far it's not, it's not feasible to do it at home, so the algorithms aren't that fast enough to decrypt it at home. But with a cloud infrastructure where you have massive amount of computing power, you can do it. And there's actually a business out there that was announced at Black Hat uh, last year, where you can actually pay $200, you, you send the hashtag of the WPA2 key over and after 24 hours you get uh, the result back. And it's actually working, so, so people have tried it. So abuse of cloud resources, that's definitely something a cloud provider is interested that customers are not doing these things with this infrastructure. The third thing, um, attacks on scalability. So remember the scalability of the web server and online shop scenario I gave you? We have nice customers over here and uh, they're accessing our online shop and our uh, infrastructure increases and scales up to satisfy the demand. So what happens if we don't have nice customers, if we have a botnet as a customer or, or a hacker group as a customer who thinks, oh yeah, I'd like to, to make a distributed denial of service attack on these resources. What will basically happen, uh, our resources scale up as well and this results in money, this results in actual costs for us. So, and we, we, were, we are in a different project in, in, in cooperation with the police in Germany over there. And they even had one customer which got kicked out of Amazon 
because he was a victim of a distributed denial of service attack. And all these infrastructures, uh, all these VMs were scaled up, scaled up, scaled up, and were actually taking too much power. So this is just fraud. This is costs. Um, you can think of the other way around. If a cloud, if a hacker gets access to your cloud infrastructure to the management backend of this, um, he can thus he can do scalability attacks the other way around. So if you have uh, a valid high amount here at your at your online shop, especially during Christmas time, um, and he just sends cloud management commands like scale down this infrastructure, then your infrastructure gets scaled down. You're not able to satisfy the, de the demand anymore. You're losing customers, basically. You're losing money. Another very severe problem in cloud computing is so far we have a, a need for security monitoring information. So far, no public cloud provider gives you uh, good information on security of your cloud. We had this last year, we had this very huge um, problem with Amazon EC2, where customers actually lost data permanently. And Amazon is providing something like a service health dashboard showing that the services uh, are up and available and running. So customers who are thinking to sign up with Amazon or any cloud provider are definitely interested in this data to see, OK, how did the service, how did the cloud perform uh, in, in former days, former weeks, former months? So. We had this incident here in April last year, and I was looking at their service health dashboard. And of course, you see here, OK, uh, Amazon in Virginia had some out time, actually over three days, which is a pretty long time. So remember, you're having your online shop, it's your business, and it's off for three, three days. And OK, so this is normal. One week later, everything was fine again, because apparently the service ha uh, health dashboard just shows you a couple of weeks of history dates. So although it's just one week, customers or new customers might be interested that the service was down for three days, but you don't get this information. You can say, yeah, they're, they're kind of hiding it or no, but they, that's just the information you get. So you might want to get more information. That's history. What about live data? Um, so far, you get huge amount of statistics uh, in Amazon about your cloud infrastructure. You get CPU consumption, you get uh, database uh, traffic, you get CPU traffic, you get memory consumption. Um, but what about security information? What about the information, uh, how many VMs are on a certain host? What about the software on a certain host? Uh, is the patch level of the software still okay? Or is it running outdated software with a lot of vulnerabilities? And there's a, there's a paper on that which just uh, investigated 5,000 Amazon virtual machine images, which are publicly available. And you can sign up with Amazon, you can boot them, you can run your stuff on it. And it showed that 98% uh, of Windows AMIs, which are the virtual machines, the virtual machine images in, in Amazon, had actually current vulnerabilities in it. 58% of Linux AMIs had actual uh, vulnerabilities in it. So you sign up, you start this VM, and you're actually vulnerable. And what's, what was very nice as well, um, concerning security information and data leakage, 21.8% had uh, sensitive data on it. Sensitive data in form of uh, usernames and password, or even private keys. Can you do with a private key? Private key? Where are the security people? You're all security people, aren't you? What can you do with a private key? Yeah, you can decrypt data, or you can establish a connection to another machine uh, into the, the company network, yeah. So pretty severe problem here. So those are the main, um, main security issues when, when we're, we're talking cloud computing. And of course, there's stuff out there which can be done. And there are traditional measurements out there. So we have technical measurements out there and organizational uh, organizational measurements out there. And from the organizational point of view, IT security standards are a thing which we use in, in practice in enterprises to, to tackle down security problems. And we got a, uh, a variety of IT security standards like the ISO, like the ITIL, 
Um, in Germany, we have the IT security baseline catalogs, which show you, okay, that's how you set up an infrastructure. That's how you make sure that your, your infrastructure is secured against the attacks. And of course, they still apply in cloud computing. But the problem is they don't uh, respect these cloud characteristics. So, for example, a very good measure to protect your data is defense and death or segregation of data, right? So you have your own hardware, you have your own wires, your data go over these specific wires. If you do cloud computing, you have virtual machines. So you have um, virtual machines on the same host. You have virtual wires. You're using your data go through virtual cables, if you like, through a virtual switch. So is a virtual switch still enough to segregate data? These guys, these guides just don't say anything about it. And of course, there are some recommendations out there from the Cloud Security Alliance or from the ENISA. Um, but they are very, very high level. Um, so, so far, uh, none of these standards consider cloud computing. From the technical point of view, we have intrusion detection system to detect intrusions, to detect when something is going wrong. But the thing with intrusion detection system is they really don't like dynamic infrastructures. They really have a problem with false positives rates when it comes to a certain uh, frequently changing infrastructure, if you like. So um, that's a problem for them. And they have no clue of, of cloud characteristics like scalability. So in an IDS, it's very nice if you, um, if you have a certain machine and you have a fixed IP and it's running on a certain uh, server hardware. But in cloud, this is all dynamic. This is all vi uh, variable. And so um, they don't cope well with cloud computing so far. So from our uh, research point of view, what we like to do over there in Germany is we want to definitely look at the missing uh, security monitoring information. We want to look at threats on scalability. And we want to look if we could detect um, if our cloud infrastructure get misused. From the provider point of view, um, definitely the misuse of the, the cloud infrastructure is of particular interest. And of course, uh, it affects its performance and its availability. So far, so good. Everybody's still with me? OK. So our approach, what we're going to do to mitigate some of these uh, security problems, is um, a project we call Security Audit as a Service. And we were looking at these, at these problems over there. And we're thinking, OK, there has to be something um, to tackle these down. And another thing you do or you have in traditional data centers are security audits. And we've looked through the, through the description of security audits. And it's basically you have some rules and an audit, is something like a check, which goes to the system, uh, checks its current state, compares it to the rules, um, which are basically security policies. And if the system, the state of the system, uh, is still complying to the rules, then everything is okay. And we thought, yeah, that's kind of a thing which, which could work with cloud computing as well. We just have to modi uh, modify it, it a little bit. So with this changing infrastructure characteristic, we need to make sure that whenever the infrastructure changes, we need to revalidate uh, some of its security status. With the scalability feature, if our audit is aware of the underlying business process, is aware of what's going on, uh, then we can model something which takes this into account. If we evaluate uh, the behavior, the typical behavior of our cloud customers, we might be able to detect when something somebody is doing something fishy over there in the cloud. One requirement we're setting over here for this project is we want to be interoperable. Uh, between different cloud architectures. So it's not just going to work on our cloud in, in Fort Wangen over there. It should work in other clouds as well. And the solution um, we're coming up with is something we call concurrent audits, which basically is provided by this infrastructure I'm going to show you. Um, so whenever basically something particular happens, we want to trigger a certain audit to revalidate the status of this certain part of the infrastructure. So how are we going to do this? We have a cloud infrastructure over there I, I introduced you to. And 
what we're going to do is we are deploying an agent framework at certain key points of this uh, cloud infrastructure. So we're deploying basically sensor agent at virtual machines um, at the cloud host, which is uh, hosting the virtual machines at our cloud management system, which is uh, responsible for deploying and managing the virtual machines. And we're collecting events from those. And those agents are monitoring activities and they're using security policies by the cloud provider or by the cloud user to validate the status. And whenever something's happening, then we're going to provide something that's called an, an audit agent, which will get created on demand, which will move to a certain VM or to a certain point of this cloud infrastructure, revalidates the security status after this change, performs a so, if you like, little audit, gives the security status back, and as long as it's still okay, then that's fine with us. So, I'm going to show it to you uh, in real to see how it's uh, working. Uh, and before I show it to you and mix around with a lot of terminals and, and web browsers, I'm going to talk you through this demo. So, what I'm going to show you in a second um, uh, is a certain scenario. And we're staying with this, with this online shop scenario. And you're going to see different screens. So, one screen I've, I've already shown you is the cloud management system. So that's our interface where we can create new virtual machines. And we also can create agents over there, um, which are or template agents which are prepared for this scenario. The second thing you don't see is in the back, and it's an agent repository. So over there, the agents, which are basically small Java programs, get created, get configured, um, and are able to, to wander around. And the third thing, um, is a graphical log. So, of course, logging takes place, and logging is the basis of all these events and informations. And to make it a little bit more friendly, we created this graphical log, which then will show you what's going on. So, our scenario is the following. We are a customer, and the customer created the virtual machine. It's a web server, and it's running in the cloud. And based on the security policies um, the, the customer set, um, an agent will get deployed. So the first thing our system notice is that the infrastructure changed because a new virtual machine was created. It then reads the security policies for these virtual machines, and these security policies from the customers say, okay, this virtual machine is going to be a web server machine, and the configuration of this web server is finished already. So it's what we say freezed. So every change uh, on this configuration uh, should be revalidated, should cons uh, result in an audit. So what's going to happen is from this uh, agent repository, the security policy gets loaded on this agent and the necessary tools uh, to monitor uh, the web server directory uh, gets loaded onto the agent and the agent will move to this web server virtual machine and just stay there. So on demand, the little Java program will get created over here and move to this virtual machine and lives over there. So from time to time, um, we're going to do periodical audits, which, so um, revalidating the status. This can be once a week, once a month, however you like. And what's going to happen is the same thing, an audit agent gets created in the agent repository, it gets supplied with the security uh, policies, so then it knows what to check on the virtual machine. The audit agent will get created over here, will move to the virtual machine, performs the security audit, does its checks, and gives the result back to our agent control center. So this is the scenario um, where we're starting with. Everybody's, everything is fine. We have a virtual machine with a web server out there. Now the customer's admin comes and changes the configuration of this virtual machine. And of course, in our scenario, he performs a change which will violate the security policies. Um, the system, the, basically the web server agent over there, the sensor agent, will detect this change. It doesn't judge this change, it just detects a change. So it will report this back to the agent control center, say, hey, a change of this configuration has happened. Therefore, uh, a new audit agent will be created automatically, will be loaded, 
to revalidate the security status of this web server configuration. The audit agent moves to the virtual machine, does the check, uh, detects that the configuration change will violate uh, or is violating our security policies and this gets then notified to the customer. So from the, from the network point of view, um, all the systems are deployed at uh, machines in our cloud back in Fortwangen in Germany. I'm going to connect to it um, over the internet. So all the, the web interfaces you see are on virtual machines over there. Um, the demo lag is, is running over there. To show you that the system is interoperable with different cloud providers, I'm not going to use a virtual machine which is running in our cloud. I'm going to use a virtual machine uh, which is running in the Amazon cloud. I'm going to connect to it and do the configuration change over there. You will see that our system will pick up um, this change in the virtual machine over there and reports back. So let's do this. So at the beginning, I said it's a, it's a live system and people are working on it. So students of mine are working in the, on it as well. And so the result will be a little bit different, but it's still going to show you something. So what we've got over here is our cloud infrastructure. And so far, we have this virtual machine up and running. And the green, green indicator is actually the security audit as a service um, platform. And it says, OK, it's up and running. We can have a look here um, at this specific virtual machine. And it can, can list the, the kind of agents which are actually running on this virtual machine right now. And so far, they're just default agents we need to have a basic functionality. So nothing in particular of this scenario. Uh, we have a second virtual machine. So I'm not going to use this one. Uh, I'm going to use this one. It's the, it's the Amazon uh, virtual machine, which is up and running. And I can, can look up the agents which are running on this machine. And again, no agents on this running so far. So what I can do is I can, uh, first of all, do a little, all right, I start with the attack. So what I'm going to do is I select a, a, a template for this. So basically, by selecting this, this service cup template here, there's basically the information, OK, this is going to be a web server, so we need a web server agent. And I'm going to deploy these selected agents to the Amazon virtual machine. What I got in this little terminal here is basically a log file. It's the, it's the live log file of the um, platform, of the agent platform, which is running at this Amazon virtual machine. And what you can see here is it's up and running. Um, nothing happened. And then just a couple of seconds ago, some agents were deployed. And it was the thing I just did here. Um, which are basically the agents which are stored in this template. So if I show the running agents now, you see two more agents here. It's basically a config agent and an event aggregator agent. So forget about the second one. The, the interesting one is the iNotify or config agent. So that's the web server agent you've seen in the, in the slides, which, is moni which are monitoring um, the configuration of this web server configuration, right? So. The second thing is our graphical demo log. And so far, nothing's going to show up here because nothing happened. So what I'm going to do now is I leave this open. I switch to a second terminal. I'm logged in. Um, I can show you basically. So this is my machine here, a little script called Amazon, which just provides an SSH login to this Amazon virtual machine, right? So right now I'm logged in to this Amazon virtual machine. Going to get uh, administrator rights. And going to execute this command. It says echo of type basic um, into something etc apache2 sites enabled 000 default. What is echo doing? Echo something into something? I'm basically adding a configuration to this web server configuration file here. That's the, that's the config file of the web server on this virtual machine, right? And I'm adding 
by echoing. I could open it, an editor and do it by hand. Um, or I'll just echo this command in. I'll do it by hand. So forget about the command. I open an editor. So that's the configuration of the web server, right? And just at the end, I'm going to add this configuration, auth type basic, which basically is a configuration which will violate, or it, which is violating the security policies of um, this, this virtual machine. So what will happen uh, in the background now is I modified uh, this configuration and I saved it. And hopefully soon the system will pick up that this configuration change has happened and a new audit agent will get created on our system, which will get deployed to this Amazon virtual machine, will check um, the configuration, will detect this change I made, and which, uh, will report back um, that something is fishy here. And this is really slow, so as I said, um, people are working on it. Normally this happens within a snip, and, and Nathan can, can confirm that. But today it's really slow, actually. We've, we've done some changes. So what you, you see here is um, actually a configuration audit agent. So an audit agent I was talking about uh, got deployed to this virtual machine. And also in this, in this graphical log here, you can see now, okay, um, an audit was performed on this virtual machine. So what was happening in the back is I did the configuration change on this virtual machine, which was running in Amazon. I'll give you the screen number here. I was changing this virtual machine over here, which was running in Amazon. And I changed the configuration. And because of the agents running on this virtual machine, they reported it back to our system. Our system looked up the security policies for this virtual machine, said, OK, if a configuration change of the web server happens, then we need to perform a new audit. So a new agent was create, created here, moved into the Amazon cloud on this machine, performed a security audit of this configuration file, detected um, a misconfiguration, and report, reported it back. So what's the... What's the mistake? There's an error in here. Yeah, exactly. So the system says everything is okay, and that's not right, because I, I did a configuration which, which violates the, the security policy. And so that's why I was introducing that people are working on it. So, so far this is a bug. Uh, yesterday it was working fine, today it's not. I'm sorry for that. So you have to just believe me, um, or ask Nathan, um, that the system is actually it is working, and it's actually performing faster than today. So, so basically, um, that brings me to the end. And then we can can start the Q and A session. Um, in cloud computing, cloud computing delivers a lot of advantages, and it delivers you a lot of possibilities to to build new infrastructure, to, to be more flexible uh, on demands of your customers, uh, to create something like, like virtual clusters, to, to just create an instance, use it, delete it, and you, you just pay a couple of cents for it. For example, if you start an Amazon uh, virtual machine, you pay per hour, and I think it's, it's one or two cents per hour. So you can use this infrastructure a couple of times and just pay cents for it. Um, so it's more than just a buzzword, uh, although industry really likes this buzzword right now. But the problem is it introduces new characteristics, new security problems, and traditional security uh, best practices, security standards are not coping with these kind of problems right now. Our approach is this um, security audit as a server architecture, um, which uses something we call concurrent audits to revalidate. Um, an infrastructure change um, when something is happening uh, over there. And what it will provide us 
is first, um, we want to be able to detect abuse of cloud resources with that. We want to identify cloud specific attacks um, and we want to work on the transparency and missing uh, security information in this cloud. What we're doing right now um, is focusing on the behavior analysis of cloud usage. Um, so that goes into the direction of detecting the, the abuse of cloud resources. There's some, some outcome of this as well, um, if you're further interested. So right now, we've, uh, during this project, we've created um, an audit criteria catalog, which is uh, targeted for cloud customers. And so you can basically download it. Unfortunately for you guys, it's in, in German. Um, so it's really interesting for German customers. And they can take it and it comes with a checklist of over 100 checks, which they can take to their cloud provider and ask them, okay, what about the security status? What about the security information? How do you make sure that my uh, resources are isolated from other customers? How do you make sure that I get informed when something is happening um, on this cloud? And so this, uh, this catalog is out there. Everybody can download it. And it's also covered in, an, in the current issue of this, this hacking magazine. Uh, you might be interested because it's in English available as well. Um, yeah. Second thing, there's a book chapter out called Understanding Cloud Audits, which we wrote, um, which basically talks about the differences of IT security audits of traditional infrastructures and when it comes to cloud computing. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.